It's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dion Carney is a senior QA engineer at Audible. Uh, he was actually the first QA engineer I hired uh, three years ago, and we've been working side by side ever since building out our QA organization. Uh, prior to Audible, Dion worked at uh, Build Trust and MLB, uh, doing automation, performance, uh, and functional testing. Uh, in the last couple of years, D1 has been a champion of accessibility at Audible. And when I say champion, if you rewind a year ago, we had few people in the company who knew what accessibility was. We had some manual testing. Uh, and today, we have uh, accessibility testing automated as part of every build. We have most of our web engineering teams trained in accessibility. And we got our senior leadership to agree not to release a feature if it has any accessibility box open. So we've come a long way, and in, in large part, thanks to the efforts uh, of Dylan. And today, he will share uh, how to get started with accessibility. So welcome, Dylan. Thank you. Good morning, contest. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about. It's a very interesting topic but it's also a very large topic. So I'm gonna to try to get through as much information as I can today. And I'm gonna be available after for any questions, comments, um, anything I can do to help you get started. So without further ado, I'm I broke this speech into three different parts. Um, we're gonna be talking about accessibility and mainly what your customers with disabilities are going through, what kind of devices they're using. And then we'll talk about common web accessibility issues and then I wanna share my story at Audible to maybe help you learn what worked and what didn't work when you go back and try to help raise the accessibility bar at your organization. Okay, so accessibility, a measure of how accessible a computer system is to everyone, and that's including people with disabilities and impairments. So let's take a step back and think about what type of disabilities your customers may have and you may not be aware of. There's auditory disabilities, and just two brief examples of these are hard of hearing and deafness and cognitive disabilities. So these could be learning disabilities. This could be anxiety, neurological, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, MS, also physical disabilities. This could be tremors, amputation, speech can include dyslexia, anxiety, uh, autism, and others, and also visual. So blindness, low vision, color blindness, but what's interesting is that with all these different disabilities, you can also break it down into whether they're permanent, temporary, or situational. So take the second row, for example. You could see that a permanent disability could be someone that's blind, right? But also a temporary disability could be someone that has a cataract, or also you just had laser eye surgery and you may be out of work for a week. And then a situational disability is gonna be perhaps a distracted driver, maybe there's glare on the windshield, and they're having a difficult time seeing at that moment. So when you think of your customers, you know, quality assurance engineers, we're very customer obsessed. You may wanna think, of course, of the people that have permanent disabilities, but also how there's other disabilities that are temporary and situational. And by making things accessible, it helps everyone, right? So it's gonna help the person that is blind and even the person that is a distracted driver or someone that is in a bar that is trying to watch the game and there's closed captioning. And all of this is called inclusive design, which is a really interesting paradigm. And it really opens up the whole accessibility window more than just you know, the permanent disabilities that you know, we are probably all empathetic about, but we wanna raise awareness that you know, it's, a, it's larger than that. So moving on, customers with disabilities using your product. So some assistive devices that your customers may be using that you don't know about could be a mouth wand or a head wand if they're unable to use their arms and also assistive type device or a switch. This allows you to interact with your keyboard if you're unable to use your fingers to press and use the keys. And also your customers with disabilities may have poor eye vision and they need to zoom in. And you need to take into account how your website looks when it's zoomed in at say 200%. And also customers that are blind, they're gonna use a screen reader. Screen reader is a huge part of web accessibility and I wanted to deep dive a little bit into that. So Christmas is coming up and I was curious, does a Christmas tree store actually sell Christmas trees? So what I'm going to do is open up the screen reader on Mac. 
Okay, so the screen reader that comes in built into all your iOS devices, whether it's your Mac or your iPhone, is gonna be VoiceOver. And VoiceOver is gonna go through the HTML and with context clues, let the user know what's on the web page. So as you can see, the customer right now is gonna hear what the link is and it's all these characters, which makes no sense to them. And at the end, it's gonna say, our latest flyer. So I'm sorry if anyone has fans, friends or family that works with the Christmas tree store, but this is going to be very difficult for our customer to navigate through the heading because each one of these links is prefixed with all these characters, which is gonna be super annoying. So imagine you can't see this site and this is how you're navigating. So conversely, we wanna know what the weather's like in Hawaii because we're gonna to torture ourselves. And if you see, this makes a little more sense. 10 day, weekend, monthly. It's not saying monthly forecast, but it could be assumed. So there could be some improvements made there. But this is how your customers are gonna navigate if they have poor eyesight or they're blind or temporary blind because they just had laser eye surgery. They're gonna use a screen reader, they're gonna navigate. And by adding these context clues, which we're gonna dive into a little bit more, they're gonna be able to tell what's on your website and really gather the same information that most of us can gather right now and we take for granted. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to screen readers. The top three players in the game right now are NVDA, JAWS, and VoiceOver. JAWS and NVDA are the screen readers that can be used on Windows devices. Uh, one is free, one is paid for, and VoiceOver is the one that I just showed you that comes in on all the iOS devices. So, so to kind of summarize this section of disabilities and your customers with disabilities and what kind of assistive devices they may be using, I want to tell you that I was at a conference last month where Micah Fowler spoke. And Micah is someone that's an actor but that happens to have cerebral palsy. And he's the star on the hit show Speechless on ABC. And Micah kind of summed it up best where he said, don't let your disability define who you are or what you can do in life. And I think that's really touching because we want our customers to not be judged by their disability, but they want things to be made more accessible. So we don't want them to be defined by their disability. So moving to section two, common accessibility issues. Um, has everyone played scrum poker or pointed stories in JIRA? Right, okay. So we're gonna do a little activity now where we'll point some of these issues. So first issue could be contrast ratio. So you could see on the left-hand side, it's very difficult to see. And contrast ratio is what the brightness is with two colors that are on top of each other. And the minimum acceptable cr criteria is to make sure it's 4.5 to one. So you could see that this is the only row here that passes that because it's 4.57 to one. That's the color ratio. All four rows above that all fail. And if someone has trouble seeing, they're not gonna be able to convey the same information that most of us can make out because we could probably see that that says hello. So if we had to go back to our developers and ask them to make this, even though you don't typically point bugs and you point stories, what do you think? Um, Scrum poker is usually like one, two, three, everyone holds up what they think, um, Fibonacci numbers. So how many points do you think it would be to make that text more legible by changing the colors? Uh, three, two, one. Ones, twos. Okay, mostly ones. Terrific. So rare, very quick win, right? And that goes a long way for all these people that have disabilities. Uh, the second one could be conveying color, uh, color conveying content. So apologies, this is kind of small, but that large slice in blue represents homework with the key on the left. However, if you're colorblind or have difficulty seeing, I have no idea what that large slice of the pie represents, right? So what we could do instead is use patterns, textures, or labels to make it possible that people that are not colorblind and colorblind can convey the same information. Making something like that happen with patterns or labels, what do we think? How many points? Twos, ones? Okay, so again, very simple fix, right? Something that we could probably bribe our developers to do and start getting UX to consider going forward, right? 
Third one, flashing or flickering content. So we're not gonna have an example of this one because this can actually cause seizures for some of your customers and it's just plain distracting sometimes. So the guidelines are three or more flashes per second can be deemed as unsafe. So we won't really give an example and point that. Another one, meaningful alt text. So sometimes alt text is missing. In this example, it looks like we actually have alt text and it says credit card logos. Can anyone think why this would actually be an issue even though there's alt text? Exactly, descriptive, which credit cards? So imagine that this box doesn't load for us, who can, most of us can see, and we hover over this and it says credit card logos. Or if you just plain cannot see the website and you're using the screen reader, credit card logos. So what would be better, right? Something like Visa and MasterCard are the accepted cards on this website. We really wanna convey the same information through multiple means. What would it take to point this? One, I don't even see it. I, I see one, two, mostly ones. So again, very simple where, you know, as long as your developers are, you know, somewhat friendly and nice where you can kind of bribe them to make a two minute fix. I mean, this would go such a long way, right? All right, the next one is missing link text. So the one on the top doesn't have any link text and the one on the bottom does. This is very simple fix, but if you're going through the screen reader and navigating your website, you're not gonna be able to tell that this says web accessibility initiative. So adding this into the HTML again, probably a really quick win, right? And finally, meaningful link text. So this one does have link text, but what could be wrong with this example? We have link text, but what do you get exactly? So what would it take to point a story where we add something to make it a little more descriptive that says, this is what we want the link to go to, accessibility videos. Uh, three, two, one. I see twos and ones. Again, very quick fix, that's gonna go a long way. And to bring back on that point, anytime you see learn more or click here, like those are gonna be big red flags that you wanna keep an eye out for. The next one is missing captions. So you're at the bar and you wanna watch the sports game, captions are really gonna help you. And also if you're in a quiet environment, such as a library, and you forgot your headphones and you wanna see what the video is conveying, Captions are gonna go a long way, right? Also, captions help those where English is a second language or you're uh, multilingual, where you wanna be able to get the same information that others are getting. Uh, a new research came out that Facebook videos are watched 85% uh, of the time without sound. So captions go a very long way. Uh, everyone is kind of, you know, heads down on their device, scrolling through things, and if your website has videos, people don't have their Bluetooth headphones on, how are they gonna get that information? And also, by adding that helps SEO, believe it or not. It helps SEO because context and text form is better indexed by search engines. And this goes back to accessibility helps everyone, right? So this is gonna help people that are unable to hear, but also it will help anyone in these other temporary situations, such as a loud bar or a quiet library. This is another one that I just learned about and I think is super neat. Next time you're on one of your favorite websites, hit the tab key and see if a box in the top left hand corner shows up. And this is called a skip to link. So a customer that's navigating your website and they're familiar with it, they're probably gonna know what your heading and navigation looks like, but they wanna get to the meat of the page, which could be search results, right? They don't wanna hear the header, header like every time they search for something. So by hitting tab, some sites will say, hey, you might be using a screen reader or you can't, can't use a mouse, we have to use a keyboard. Um, do you wanna go to the main content of the page? And you can download a tool that will tell you and count the amount of tabs that it takes to get to the meat of the page, which could be like the first item in a search results page. And you can see that sometimes it's gonna take users like 30 tabs just to get to the main part that they want. Now, yes, power users that use screen readers, they are, they're experts, they know they're gonna get through this. There, there's other shortcuts, you can navigate by headings and links, but it's still very powerful to add this skip link. I mean, even imagine one of us, we're eating lunch, um, we have like dressing all over our hands from this sloppy sandwich and like we don't wanna use the mouse 
and we're just kind of tabbing through while we're testing. We hit tab and we're like, tab, enter. I just skipped all those items. All right, next up. So who says that these are actually issues? So the W3C has web content accessibility guidelines, and this is typically called WCAG, and they are summed up into the acronym POOR. So you want your website to be perceivable, which is that multiple senses can get the same information. So this kind of goes to our alt text example, where we were able to see the MasterCard and Visa logos, and we were also able to pick it up with a screen reader because it had correct alt text. And you want it to be operable, so multiple ways of interacting with the website. So some folks may use a mouse, but some folks may only be able to use a keyboard or a head wand or a switch. And also you want your website to be understandable because the content makes sense. So that kind of goes back to our click here or those learn more links. And then finally robust. And this just means that there's no regression. You wanna make sure that as you iterate and have new releases and as new browsers and new screen readers come out, there's no regression. Okay, part three, my story of getting started. So my baseball career never really took off. So we'll fast forward to 2016. So 2016 to 2018, I'm noticing this trend. I'm noticing that doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results, right? Definition of insanity um, by Einstein. So I noticed that accessibility issues were not becoming something that was prioritized. It was something that we kind of did once a year after hours with pizza and beer. It just didn't seem like it was something that, like it was something that could just be saved for a once a year activity, which I felt was kind of wrong. And others did too, but that was just kind of like the way things were going. We also noticed that if there was a huge regress, regression and there was a huge accessibility issue, it was kind of like, why aren't we testing for this? And it was just kind of like a back and forth thing where it only became a big deal when there was a fire. So how I got started, um, I was actually sitting at that table back there last year. And I don't know if anyone remembers uh, Thomas uh, Harver's speech. Was anyone here for his talk? A few of you. Does anyone remember the pizza story? I don't know why that stuck out so much. But he gave a lot of examples of how to create what he called like good waves, so you don't want to rock the boat too much, but you want to create these good waves. And his whole thing was that change can come within rather than from management. So he had this really interesting chat with us where he said he wanted people on his team to learn automation and learn how to code. So he thought, well, let's do that during lunch and we'll have the company bring in pizza and I'll get some points for helping others and others are gonna learn how to automate, win-win. And the company said, if you're team is going to work during lunch, we'll just give them more work. Like, that, that just makes sense, right? So Thomas is like, well, if I just buy the pizza and sit in the room and people come in and listen to me, like, that can happen, right? And they're like, no, I mean, again, like, we'll just give them more work if they don't have enough work and they're going to just goof off during lunch. So Thomas created these, this good wave, right, where he was like, well, I'm just going to bring in pizza because I like pizza and I'm just going to sit it down in the conference room and keep the door open. And I'm just going to talk to myself about automation and coding and best practices. And he did this. He actually did this. And he was smart about it. He captured data to show if you got in trouble that it was useful. So we had everyone fill out a survey that said, hey, did I learn something? Was this useful? And by creating this good wave, eventually this woman, and correct me if the story is wrong. This is how I remember it. This woman ends up on the news. She's volunteering at high schools and teaching kids how to code. And they're like, oh, how did you get into this? Where do you work? She works at this company. The, uh, the higher up people that said no to pizza are now saying like, oh, like how did this happen? This is great, who introduced training? And you get the point of it. So I thought like maybe I can create some good waves and create change within rather, rather than like waiting for, you know, upper management to kind of say like, yes, like now is gonna be the time where accessibility is a blocker and definition of done. So I'll walk you through a couple things that worked for me, and hopefully there's some takeaways that you get out of this. So the first thing I did was started to create some metrics, and this could be very lightweight for you too, right? Like, how about you go back next week and just test one or two pages, your top one or two pages, and just record a couple of accessibility bugs. And this is really important because when you look back from a year from now, and you're up here talking about it, you're gonna be able to show where you started from. And I did this by seeing what issues existed. Um, I tried to pull data, like how many customers do we have that are using a screen reader right now? 
because someone's eventually going to ask that. How many users are changing the default uh, font size on our website and it's zoomed in? And also um, try to get some like metrics about customer support calls. So in a year from now, we could see if those numbers have gone down once we implement this grassroots movement. So the next thing is I tried to automate wherever I could. Um, I'll show you a couple of tools later that makes testing a little bit easier. We had the benefit of having an internal tool from Amazon that allowed us to check for accessibility issues on every code commit. And that way, after a certain regression, we can block a team's pipelines and say, you know, this is something you have to be, uh, something you have to fix. The other thing that really helped me was finding different trailblazers. So I reached out to other companies that I was able to Google and find that they had, you know, an accessibility program and learn what they did. And, you know, they're, they're doing the same thing I'm trying to do, but three or five years prior. And you can also reach out to these people as mentors because they probably reached out to someone five years ago and had a mentor too that showed them what worked and what didn't work. And you'll learn a lot from these people and they'll save you a lot of work. Uh, presentation, so this was really big. Um, I knew personally, like I need to, there's a couple check boxes I have to fill out. And, I, and one of them is like scope of influence and helping others. So I wanna present just selfishly because I wanna like be able to give back and check those check boxes. But also these teams are having these meetings where I could step in and talk about this topic that they, are, that they don't really know much about, so they're gonna be really captivated and it's a win-win situation. And what I found is that I never got turned down to talk about this. And I went to any team's town hall, any team's planning, anyone that wanted to have me, whether it was a marketing team, a development team, uh, working with people in customer service. And by spreading this word, you realize that a lot of people aren't really aware of accessibility. People don't know that uh, blind people use our website. So showing what it looks like to go through a screen reader, showing what our website looks like in black and white. I mean, these are things that really hit home to some people. And now you start making some of these allies where you, know, you, you can kind of gauge in the room like who's really interested in this and you're gonna pull them in and start having them be part of your committee. Um, existing bugs, I kind of broke down bugs into existing and new. I knew we weren't gonna boil the, the whole ocean, but I wanted existing bugs to be something that we bring in like one bug a sprint, like get agreement from your dev teams to just one bug. We all pointed it earlier, right? These were all one point bugs. It's something that wouldn't make or break a sprint. And I found that Getting new hires to work on this not only helps them like promote the change, but it also gives them uh, a low risk change where they can get their hands into the code and the SDMs, the software development managers are really gonna be open to, oh yeah, like that'd be great for someone new. With existing bugs, I also found that donuts were very important. Um, I would bring in donuts if a team fixed one or two of these issues and now the other teams are looking to see why did that team get donuts and then they're quickly picking them up. Uh, that suddenly backfired when teams started asking for empanadas and such. But for new bugs, I made sure to try to get accessibility built into the definition of done. So picture this, like would this be a blocker? Um, I'm unable to check out and purchase an item on your website. Like that would block a release, right? So if I'm trying to go through that flow with a screen reader, it should also block the release, right? And just promoting like that, that idea of it and making those allies in the room that you presented to, like you're gonna have people that buy into it, right? So for existing bugs, we tried just grabbing a couple of sprint and for new bugs, we wanted to make sure that we weren't releasing anything new. It was definition of done, part of the requirements. All right, so moving on, some other things that happened. Uh, we wound up creating a committee with all those allies that we formed and this committee was very lightweight. We just met monthly, but it started expanding where every meeting, people were inviting more and more people. People that I didn't even know that existed in our company. We had people from public policy to communications to customer support, UX product, development, QA. And it was very interesting to not only meet new people, but also you know, hear from someone that has a cousin that's blind, that would be willing to come in and speak to our committee for no, you know, for no particular reason, just to like let us know you know, how they feel about the website. And we felt like that was really impactful. We created an email distro and a Slack room, and we would share news articles. And now you realize, this is why nothing happened 2016, 2018, because I didn't know these people existed. I didn't know that they shared some of the same feelings and were really empowered to make a change like I am. So now we start becoming force multipliers, and we start creating these awareness events. 
And some of these awareness events are happy hours, um, hackathons, um, anything to kind of get people in a room with, I mean, not to bribe them, but like, yeah, there, like, there was food and beer, but we, <laughs> we do like, we made it a point to show, and I'll show pictures later, that it was more than that. Um, so we also started creating swag. So we created a logo for our committee and no one is against having more stickers and t-shirts and mugs. So this really went a long way. And if you felt like, you know, people were fixing bugs, okay, here, here's a mug on your desk. Now their colleagues are asking, oh, what's that? So again, like you're really spreading awareness through very quick wins. Um, then I took a step back and I realized maybe I'm taking for granted that everyone knows how to make these alt text changes. And maybe we should have people go through proper training. So I created a very lightweight one hour guide of a couple different videos and quizzes and reading material and started tracking teams that went through this. Again, it became a competition where teams were kind of seeing, because we had it on a wiki page that showed who was taking uh, the training and when. And I was also asking for feedback on that page. So what was important is that a lot of people were saying, this was a 10 out of 10, very helpful. Well, now their colleagues are going to want to take this. Then we had conferences, so no one is against traveling. So this also helped me because now I have other subject matter experts, and it's not all on me to kind of answer these difficult questions around accessibility. So we sent people out to Seattle and had them come back fully trained, um, ready to be an advocate for accessibility. Um, local outreach is very important too. So reaching out to your customers and seeing if they would be willing to pilot a new feature that you're rolling out where they may have disabilities. Um, there's local groups for the blind in all of your towns and cities. So working with them is really meaningful too. And our latest thing that we're starting to do this month is creating a type of review board. We're calling it a bar raiser program. So any feature or project that's going out can meet with our small panel where we will hold office hours and we'll review their projects and help guide them the whole way because we, we're not sure if they know everything they need to know about accessibility and we want them to have like an open space where they can come and ask questions and almost have their projects certified and stamped and make sure that they follow this framework that we're outlining for them. Okay, getting started. So I wanted to share some cool tools. A lot of these are browser plugins. So the first one is called No Coffee. And no coffee is really neat because it's going to show you what your website looks like. What? No coffee. <laughs> so no coffee is going to show what your website looks like with different uh, vision impairments. So no coffee. Like is it... <laughs> no coffee. So No Coffee is showing what the website looks like for Sketch.com, that's hosting our agenda. And it's showing what it looks like if someone has color blindness. So not to pick on Sketch.com, but this guide right here shows the breakdown of, of type. And it's correlated to these colors here, but again, very difficult to see if you're someone that's color blind. And No Coffee will also show what your website looks like with different eye diseases. So this is macular degeneration and it's an eye disease, and this is what some customers may be viewing. Moving on, Con color contrast ratio. So I also looked at the AMA site, which we're here today at, and they have something in their heading that's 3.97 contrast ratio, which is below that 4.5 number, and it's this right here that's selected. And for someone that has trouble seeing, that gray, font on the gray background is going to be difficult to convey what that says. All right, accessibility insights. So this is pretty neat. This was in an earlier slide I had, and it can track the tab counts that it takes to get to the main call of action of your website. So if without, without that skip to link, you can use this to show your product and UX folks. If we don't have that skip to link that is enabled when you press the tab button, it's going to take X amount of clicks to get to what we want the customer to see on this site, which is to download a brochure, perhaps. And then also this tool, besides counting tabs, will scan your page and flag any issues in red, tell you what the issue is, and tell you how to fix it. So by using these and tracking bugs by finding these issues, um, very quick wins. 
Another one is Google Lighthouse. So this gives you actually a score of how your page is doing. And you could scan you know, your top five pages when you get back next week at work and just see what your score is for the heck of it. It's very easy to do, it takes one second. It'll tell you what the issues are and how to fix them. And you could track this over the course of a year and see if you're getting better as you fix issues. Now, those were all plugins, but nothing really substitutes for the real thing. So that's going through a screen reader on your website. So this is also something I would highly recommend and just open up VoiceOver or download NVDA or JAWS on Windows, tab through the site, pick one page and see if you can catch anything. Um, so for example, you may find a link that doesn't tell you where it's going and that's gonna be really very, issue, uh, very difficult for a customer that has trouble seeing. But for us, most of us are gonna be able to tell that this link will take us to the AMA Conference Center. All right, so what you could do, um, I would start with data, like I was saying before. So we, would, we found it very useful to create a burn down chart that showed what bugs were being open and how many were being fixed. You could track your progress with that Google Lighthouse app um, plugin I was telling you about. You can also track using website metrics. So say over the course of the year, you fix this many bugs, has like, has different metrics about your website gone up? Like has page abandonedness gone down because people are staying on the page longer because they were able to navigate and convey information better? And also you can look at your call center, like see if there's less calls around accessibility being uh, called in from customers that are having issues. And all those are important because people are gonna ask at some point, like where do we stand on accessibility? And that's the question that I have the very trouble like answering because it's something that you always wanna keep iterating on, right? Like I don't know if anything can ever be like fully accessible. Like there's, you, there's always gonna be new releases and you always wanna keep iterating. But by keeping some of these metrics that all things equal, like our call volume has gone down around accessibility issues or all things equal, our Lighthouse score has gone up. So these are really important because people are going to ask this eventually. Um, so what you could do, like process and culture, like I said, donuts were really important. Uh, T-shirts, stickers, mugs, any type of swag that you can create, people are really going to buy in. I don't know why, but it's cool. Um, creating a hackathon, so a lot of companies are doing this now. I even saw one around 3D printing accessibility. A hackathon was made around that. And this is a one or two day event have people go in, think of ideas, work together, and implement them around accessibility. And also just hanging up some silly posters like this in your elevator. I mean, we're in the elevator for two minutes, don't really have anything to do or talk about or look at besides our phone. And if this is in front of me and I didn't know anything about accessibility or I didn't know what a screen reader was, like this is gonna go a long way and that's such a quick win. Again, no one is against the happy hour. So we put on a happy hour two months ago and we had, you know, besides the beer, we had some like really cool signs like how would you get this beer if you were in a wheelchair? How would you get this beer if you were unable to see? So really tried to get people to think about what it's like for some of our customers that have disabilities. We had different uh, screen reading uh, stations. So a lot of people didn't even know what a screen reader was, but they were going through our website and we had it a stopwatch where we would time people to see how quickly they can navigate our site to put an item in their shopping cart. And then of course they get swag for first and second place. Um, we had different swag, we had headphones, and then we had some accessibility devices where we had some people talking about these. And these are actually, accessibility devices are actually quite expensive that customers put um, audiobooks on that a lot of us had no idea about, but they need the capability to listen on these devices because it's easier to listen to something on something with this user interface if you're blind compared to an iPhone and going through an app. So three things to kind of be careful and to look out for. Um, bug bashes are better than nothing, but you don't want to convey that message that, hey, this is something that we can do after hours. Um, it's something that should be like thought about each and every day, right? Also legal, um, speak to your legal department before you make any claims that your website or app is accessible, ADA compliant, WCAG 2.0 certified. Um, just talk to them first because it's kind of a, a slippery slope where um, if you're releasing ever so often, um, it's gonna be difficult to catch everything and you don't wanna put that target on your back 
because soon as someone may see that, oh, you're ADA compliant, but what about this? Um, you're just gonna maybe cause more issues than good. But if you're continuously iterating and making it more accessible, accessible each time, every time you release, um, I think your customers are gonna be more thankful for that. And then also empathy. This is something that I just learned about in the past six months, but apparently the industry around web accessibility has shifted from introducing accessibility with empathy to more about knowledge and awareness. And the reason for this is because customers don't want you to feel bad for them because they have a disability. Again, a disability does not define who they are. And by using empathy, how I was trained a couple years ago was I, would put on, I was told to put on mittens and try to navigate our website with mittens on. Or blindfold, navigate the website blindfolded with a screen reader. And while these are impactful tools, what could be better is actually using knowledge and awareness and using some of that swag and events. And next time you present, present maybe in black and white or show someone what the website looks like with a screen reader. This kind of knowledge lowers the, the fact that we're being empathetic for these customers and more about raising awareness and helping them each and every day. So what I found to be very useful, and I wish I knew in the beginning, is that I had to start choosing my pitch. So I realized that some people wanted to hear the legal perspective pitch, where we want to avoid lawsuits. If you look last month, Domino's was in the news for a huge lawsuit around web accessibility, and I highly recommend learning and reading about that and sharing it with people on your team just to say this could be us one day. The second one is business perspective. So this could be something that you wanna maybe share with your marketing team. So one in, two people, one in two people over the age of 50 have difficulty seeing, it's a fact. 10% of the population has dyslexia. 15% of the world's population has a disability. One in 200 women are colorblind and one in 12 men are colorblind. You share these numbers with your marketing or UX team, I think it's a no-brainer that they're gonna to want to make the website more accessible. And then some other pitches that will help with other people. Uh, there's the financial perspective. There's, I know it says empathetic, so we're gonna call it the customer obsession perspective, and it's the right thing to do. So this is something to maybe use when you pitch to your QA team, right? We're all very customer obsessed. And then future self, I like using this one with development teams. I pitch accessibility to them because I say, as we get older, some of our abilities like sight are gonna deteriorate a little bit and we wanna kinda of develop for our future selves. And I think one of the coolest pitches is the curb cut effect. This tells you that accessibility helps everyone. That curb cutout was not developed for someone with luggage or a stroller or a bike or a skateboard. It was developed for someone that was disabled, but we all use this each and every day. Same thing with closed captioning. Um, SMS text messages, uh, the list goes on and on. I could do a whole presentation on inventions that came out of, from people that were disabled to help them that we all use each and every day. So some takeaways, I would highly recommend don't do it alone. That's what I did the first two years and you just get burnt out. And by creating a committee, finding people to work together, it kind of spreads like wildfire and um, it's actually shocking how simple it is and I, I wish I did that sooner. And another thing is creating good waves. Um, you don't wanna rock the boat too much and go against people in your company. But like Thomas did last year, he told us how he was able to get buy-in just by doing it without people knowing about it. And that's kind of what we're doing right now. And there's been no, it's only been like praise so far. We've had this grassroots movement since the beginning of 2019. And we've noticed um, a burn down on our backlog. We're no longer, releasing with accessibility bugs. And what Thomas said is change can come within rather than management. And I think that's something to really take back because that really hit home for me. I wanna thank Anna and Tanya for having me as, and having the, thanking the rest of you for having me today. I'm gonna be around for the rest of the day and right after this to just talk if you have any questions, anything I can do to help you get started and picture of my puppy because why not? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone.